Welcome back to a captain's log. I'm Brian Kreutz, the ambassador to the fans, which is all of you tuning in from your various satellite connections. Now the biggest Trekkie in the universe is standing next to my right, and that is Lily Fox Loom. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what an introduction. Thanks, BK. I may be one of the biggest Trekkies on the Earth planet, but the whole universe yes. might be a stretch. <laughs> Who knows? There could be a whole alien race dedicated to watching and memorizing <laughs> Star Trek content. But either way, I'll take the compliments. All right, <laughs> absolutely. You. No problem, Lil. Well, if Star Trek obsessed alien race like that doesn't exist out in the universe, then I hope they too are tuning into our show from their very distant satellite connection. We have a very special show in store this week, Lily. We do. <laughs> yes, we do. We provide cutting edge news, inside scoops, exclusive interviews, <laughs> and so much more here on a get scoops. Here on a captain's log, Star Trek has graced our screens and lives for almost 60 years. Well, not our personal, not, personal. not our lives for 60 years. We're not 60. You don't know. We, <laughs> we're de-aging. De there have been so many adventures, characters, planets, combat scenes, heartwarming relationships, and un forgettable moments and there are still so many more to come. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking the de-aging is a huge sci-fi type plot. It is. Right? Yeah. We truly have been lucky to be alive and to experience a lot of this television magic. But like any Trekkie after watching the shows, we are left wanting more. Now, <laughs> Enterprise often goes on to discover new planets or life forms on their journey through space. Our ship this fictional ship here in a studio in Pasadena, California, we hope to discover new information and new relationships surrounding the vast universe of Star Trek cast and crew. <gasps> you just used the word discover twice. Was that a sneaky hint? Oh, like about discovery? today's special guest? Yes, yes like discovery. <laughs> you're right, Lily. I think you're onto something. Yes, it was. It was? Ah, oh, I thought so. Well, okay, since the cat is out of the bag, let's get introduced to our guest for this week. Our guest is from Star Trek. Discover. I thought yes. you were going to say it with me. Discovery. Discovery. She plays President Tarina in seasons 3, 4, and 5 of Star Trek Discovery. On the show, she's a Vulcan who serves as the president of Navarre. And through her communications with Captain Burnham and Captain Saru, she helped ally Navarre and the Federation as new dangers like the gravitational anomaly were introduced to their galaxy. Also, her and Captain Saru sparked a bit of a romance oh, at the end cool. of season four, which I was very excited about. I love Saru. I really do. Saru's awesome. And you even do an amazing Saru walk, really, too. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> we might see that in behind the scenes at some point. Now, way to show off that Trek knowledge, Lils. Actually, that was impressive. I mean, uh, quite a big line that you had there, but a lot of good Trek information. President Tarina is played by an actress and her name is Tara Rosling. She's a Canadian-born actress who's found success in both theater and film. Trek fans will, like us, will know her best from her role as President Tarina, as Lily uh, just pointed out. She's also starred in Impulse, Happy Place, plus so many more films and shows. It's hard to talk about. It is hard to talk about, BK. And she's also known for using the Vulcan mind meld multiple times in an attempt to get to know the species 10C better and helped Cleveland Booker connect to his past. Oh, yeah. You know, BK, I was thinking, I've never tried to do a mind meld before. And Spock is half Vulcan and he has the ability, so maybe I do too. Oh, I'm not sure I like where this is going, is it? <laughs> what is I saw what you saw. I, 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 <laughs> you saw what I seen. I see what? your mind. I, I, yes. Oh I, my I gosh, our minds mind. became one. This is a real mind melt. You know, I know you've portrayed a Vulcan before and had the pointed ears, but I, I thought know. it was. I didn't really. Think, I didn't really think I could. I could do that. You did it. You did it. Wow. <laughs> I've never felt this never, type of like. I know. I've mouth. never felt this powerful before. <laughs> what? Wow. That was Vulcans. incredible. That was amazing. It was. <laughs> you want to try it again? Let's do it again. Let's do oh, it again. Oh, well. 
Let's just practice it. Let's practice it again. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe we should wait till oh. after the Tara Rosling interview. I would like to. Oh, okay. Yeah. I would like yeah to. Preserve our energy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Good point. You know, maybe she can give us <laughs> tips on technique as well, so we don't. Oh yeah. You for know. being a Vulcan and being able to do it as a portray it as an actress, mm -hmm. or even like perhaps uh, our Vulcan psyche yeah. able to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, Tara is patiently waiting for us to connect to our server, so we better move on. But before we get to Tara's interview, we have a quick news segment to take care of, right, Lil? Yes, that's right, BK. Let's kick this thing into hyperdrive and jump into the news. <laughs> <laughs> As many of you Trekkies know, Star Trek Discovery officially launched its fifth and final season on April 4th. It's been two years and counting that what? we've been waiting for this moment and it Patient. finally came. <laughs> I can't believe it myself. I was so excited and I'm still so excited to see how all of this ends in Star Trek Discovery. A lot of the episodes up until now have been showing so much finality to them, but mm -hmm. so many momentous life choices and big moments in Star Trek Discovery. I'm still not over the fact though that Captain Saru last mission came in only season two of I Star Trek know, Discovery. Are you know, kidding me? It's my... It's mind blowing. It's so sad to it see is. him go. Yeah. But you know, I love a good romance, BK. Mm -hmm. And the Saru President Tarina romance is one for the Trek agents. It really is. <laughs> Besides, out with the old and in with the new, as they say. <laughs> I think the dynamic between Captain Burnham and Captain Rayner will continue to be very interesting to follow, mm -hmm. especially when Burnham chose him over her former lover book. What? I know. That was a huge shock, right? Yeah. Star Trek soap opera esque. But you never can count out book. Right? That's right. <laughs> Season 5 also introduced two cool new villains, Maul and Locke. They are the Bonnie and Clyde duo who have arrived to disrupt Captain Burnham's final journey. But as we know, Burnham and her team won't go without a fight. They never will. <laughs> right, BK? That's right. Also, the Federation has Fred, a soon type synthetic, who is a merchant and fence on the planet Kamau. That's cool. <laughs> who knows how influential he can be in taking future episodes to take down Mole and La. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just love Discovery so much. I really never want it to end. I know. <laughs> oh, but all good things must come to an end. That's true. And besides, there's a spin-off series called Starfleet Academy, which wait. most likely features fan favorite Lieutenant Sylvia Tilly. And I know how yes. much you love Tilly, BK. Absolutely. I do. And you know, it's great to also have something to look forward to. Plus, we'll have the rest of Star Trek Discovery Season 5 on Paramount Plus Thursdays. And we also have a little bit of Star Trek news that I hope we didn't spoil too much for you, but a lot of you are already watching it on Paramount+. Plus. Stick with us after the break because we have an exclusive interview coming up next. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Now it's time to get to a special inside look into one of the key figures of the late seasons of Discovery, President Tarina. She is the Vulcan president of Navarre, and as you know, BK, I love the Vulcans. Yes. Tarina is played by the multi-talented Canadian actress Tara Rosling. Trekkies, we're going to take you inside the life of a successful, successful actress and learn all about the behind-the-scenes nature of filming Star Trek Discovery. Yes, can't wait How for this. How cool is that? Yes, it became apparent that season five of Discovery would be no ordinary season as the final season we say goodbye to beloved characters, but also learn about new characters, including new villains. Now, the strength of the Federation allies and teamwork become more critical than ever before as they face some of the biggest challenges in all of the Trek universe. One of the key figures is the Federation's success in season four was President Tarina, and we're lucky enough to have her here with us today on a captain's log. So enough Trek no babble, let's dive into the interview. We can't wait. Welcome to a captain's log, Tara. It's my absolute pleasure. Thanks, Brian. Now, Tara, as you studied acting in college at York University in Toronto, I assume that you decided from a very young age that you wanted to be an actress. When did you start pursuing that dream and what kind of training did you have growing up in the Vancouver area? I decided when I was 13 that I that acting was what I wanted to pursue. Um, it was I had like a hunch that I wanted to explore it a little bit. And my we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. So my grandmother and my mom, I, I grew up with a single mom. Um, for my birthday, they gifted me some acting classes at like some kind of, I don't remember the name of the school, but it was in downtown Vancouver. And um, um, I had a really wonderful teacher. I, again, I should remember her name, but this is a long time ago. <laughs> 
uh, and we were working on monologues and just it, by some very subtle direction, um, I had a, like a, I described it as a life altering experience where I just, um, I was so inspired by the work that we were doing in the class that, that, that I decided then and there that that's what I wanted to pursue. It was just so, um, I guess I just, I felt like I was on fire and, um, it was a monologue from Antigone. I don't know if you're familiar with that story um, that I actually ended up using for a long, long time because it was a very special monologue. And then, um, yeah, so from there I went, there was a school in in um, uh, West Vancouver, close to UBC, that had a specialized theater program for grades 11 and 12. And then from there I auditioned um, and I ended up at York University uh, to do the BFA program um, in theater. Um, in 88, I went in. Sarah Jabakanji, reporter from CBC in Toronto, conveyed that Ontario reached a record high level of film and TV production in 2022, supporting 419 productions, which contributed roughly $3.15 billion to the economy. Wow. You've been part of that record-breaking economy, and I would assume you've seen the other end of the spectrum where the beginnings of TV and film were just getting started for Warp Speed in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Your early on-screen roles were in the Toronto area. Please go through your perspective of your early roles in your career and this exponential growth in Toronto. That's an interesting question. I find it fascinating because actually when I got out of school, which would have been 94, um, I couldn't get a theater job to save my life. And one of my acting professors at York had referred me to a very good agent in Toronto. So I ended up doing a fair bit of film and TV auditioning. And back in the day, you could have two or three auditions in one day. Um, and I ended up getting a fair bit of work in the film and TV industry. Um, but it seemed like it was really hopping back then and there. And I'm really surprised to hear that 2022 is like the apex because that's like, right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. And like, I know that certainly things were extremely slow last year because of the strikes, but I think that if I had to surmise, I guess that there were fewer productions during the pandemic because it was so expensive to, with the upkeep with all the protocols, like all the testing, like for, for instance, Discovery, they had a COVID testing like trailer right on set and everybody was the entire cast and crew and admin i think were tested three times a week like the the expense of that would have been extraordinary so uh um i believe you or whoever this person is that said that <laughs> but i think it was equally busy like i think that i think that the 90s were pretty pretty hopping busy as well and like i can't i can't really comment a whole lot on the on the whole thing to begin with, because um, my career as an actor has been primarily in the theater. So um, I've done a lot of um, long theater seasons at the Shaw Festival and a couple at the Stratford Festival. So really, if I'm if I'm doing in film and TV, I'm just picking up stuff in the off season, which would be November through to February. Um, although I did take like four or five years away uh, when we were shooting Discovery and other things as well. So. Um, yeah, I find that 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 I, I find that really curious. That's an interesting statistic. You currently have 44 IMDb acting credits dating all the way back to 1993. In addition, you're also a very accomplished theater actress. How does screen acting compare to stage acting? Well, they're two very different mediums. Um, I mean, a, an obvious example of the differences between the two is that after you've rehearsed a play and you're performing for the audience, you step out on stage and you just go through the whole story. And if you happen to screw up along the way, you don't have the luxury of doing another take or, um, and there's, uh, you know, it's it's an incredibly different sensation to perform to a live audience as opposed to, you know, to a camera and, and just in a, in a, like an airtight space or if you're on location, whatever, but um, you definitely like the, the audience becomes an integral, part of the experience when you're doing theater because you're it's the given give and take of energy uh, across the edge of the stage and that's you know makes every single performance unique another, another difference is the money <laughs> 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 film and tv is far more lucrative than theater you know um there's uh, sadly there's many many of my colleagues in toronto have had to find new ventures um during the pandemic or post-pandemic theater hasn't bounced back yet 
and um, it's a really, um, I think it's a worrisome time for those of us who work or practitioners primarily in the world of theater. Um, yeah, and yeah, there's a, there's a few examples, but um, I would say that just because I've done more theater and because it's my background that I, to this day, feel um, far more at home in the world of theater and on stage than I do. I like, I don't know what different lenses are and I, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, no, this is my best side or, um, um, but I've certainly like, I think it's, uh, if, if you can work in both worlds, it's such a gift because you learn so much from each world um, to lend and you can lend that um, information or that knowledge to the other. Um, and there's a real, you know, it depends on the kind of theater that you're doing, but TV demands a level of, of realism or naturalism um, that is that coming from a theater background, certainly when I was a young actor, people would be just, uh, can you, can you just, um, can you maybe stay on your mark? Can you just make it a bit smaller, a bit, you know, because you're, you're used to uh, working at such a, a, a large scale. This is wonderful insight, Tara. Do you see any performance similarities between Star Trek and theater? I've actually mentioned this to a number of people is that I do think the world of Star Trek is well suited to theatrically trained actors because it's the, the text can be so dense mm -hmm. um, that you need, I think that if you have a background in being able to, to ground down and deliver text with real conviction, uh, like, like you have to do with a Shakespearean monologue or a Shavian monologue, right? Yeah. Um, and the characters are, some, some are larger than life. And so absolutely, I think there's a beautiful overlapping between the world of Star Trek and the world of theater. And I have to ask, what is your favorite memory of Hollywood on or off screen since we're here in LA? I like to ask. <laughs> I did spend some time in LA. It was after I did, um, there was a, a, a new version of The Taking of Pelham 123. It was like a remake of that old film. And um, uh, on the film or the movie of the week, it w there was Vincent D'Onofrio and his manager was around a lot. And so he offered to represent me. And I was like, oh, this is an opportunity. I, you know, I, I felt like if I didn't explore it that I would have regretted it. Yeah. So like I, you know, sold all my earthly belongings and packed up this beater piece of car that I bought and like drove down with a boyfriend and we lived, um, here's a story for you. So my boyfriend at the time, Chris Heyerdahl, uh, Alice Krieger was his friend and we stayed in her guest house in Malibu. <laughs> and, and I could barely like, to, I think just before I left, I managed to finally line up an agent. I had a few meetings and most of the stuff that I was auditioning for was for Canadian content. So really I could have auditioned for it back home in Canada, but the experience certainly was, um, you know, when I, I have a lot of stories from the experience and I don't know that I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I felt, I, I think it, for, if anything, it, it um, reconfirmed for me um, that I prefer to work out of Canada, that Canada is kind of my, you know, I like to ride my bike to auditions or I did when I lived in Toronto and, and, um, the fact that you're not supposed to get on public transit in LA, it was just like, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a wild experience, but no, I've never actually, I've never shot in the States. I've shot in Paris, but not in the States. And I've never done any theater in the States. Oh, I lie. Our production of St. Joan, um, on which I met my husband in 2007, went to Chicago Shakespeare. Yeah, so we were there in 2000, early 2008. Please tell us your first moments of learning about your character named Tarina from your agent leading up to the audition and then landing the role. And if you can share your thoughts on the character motivations and for your portrayal, as I'm wondering, did you take any inspiration from previous Vulcans? So actually Derek came on the scene after, after the fact. I think it was, I signed on with Derek after the first season aired. I don't know, it was through Doug Jones because he represents Doug Jones yeah. and so I I, I like most Canadian actors have have a good old agent in Toronto um, and uh, 
I mean, I've told this story a few times, but it's, I think a lot of people have familiar stories with, with Star Trek. So in, initially you get, a, you get a call from your agent saying, I have an audition for you. It's for a project called Tennessee Honey, but that's a code name. Um, I need it. I need it back by tomorrow. Like it wasn't even 24 hour turnaround. And I'm like, okay, sure. Send it over. And in the sides, it, the character was an admiral. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's all I was given. Um, I'm like, okay. So I, I, I laid it down. And then a couple days later, um, my agent told me that I'd been, um, shortlisted, that they wanted me to come in for a prosthetics fitting, but this was before there'd been any offer. It was just like the, you're, you're in contention and they want to know if you can come in. It's like, well, that's so bizarre because like, why would I go in and, and do anything if they haven't offered me the part? Like, is it because they want to see if I'm, um, claustrophobic or like there's all these things too you have to say in your audition like I'm not allergic to latex I'm not claustrophobic I can wear contact lenses like this um so I decided to go ahead and do it um but by the time I got to Toronto because I live like an hour and a half outside the city uh he called again and he said they've offered you the part so I went in and I and this is a crazy story too. Like I walk on set and, you know, there's everybody running around doing their thing. And I'm like, hi, I'm here for a prosthetics thing, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay, follow me here. And they take me onto the track and there's these two guys and they're, they're a pretty mad duo. Like you can tell that they've been working together for a long time. And again, I can't, sorry, I counted, chalk it up to menopause. Like I'm at that time where my memory doesn't quite, like I don't retain everything, but it was clear they'd worked together for a long time. And they're like, okay, Tara, come with us. And they like lead me away to this room down this corridor and they s entirely suit up their bodies, like in like plastic. And, um, and they're kind of making jokes that I like should have told somebody where I was. And <laughs> and then they're like I have to close my eyes and they're going to pack all this stuff on my head and it's going to take a while to dry and please don't move around too much and blah 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 so what they ended up doing was the full the full mold of my face um but I still didn't know like who the character was or um so it wasn't until I got the script and I think that must have been two or three weeks later that I got I finally got a copy of the script that I found out that her name was Trina. She was a Vulcan, which I didn't know. And she was the president. She was a president. Like I was like, oh my God. And it, and it wasn't even because I think for the audition, it might've been one scene. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm in this, I'm in this episode. Like, I was like, I got some text to learn. And it, again, it's not easy text to like, you don't just kind of read it once and, and you're done. Like it, I, I had to spend a lot of time <laughs> committing that to memory. And, and also partially because I was I was nervous about the gig. I was excited and I was nervous because it comes with such a legacy, right? I didn't go and look at any footage or I didn't go and, and no. do a lot of Googling. I didn't want to base it too much on somebody else's and I didn't want to feel too intimidated by somebody else's performance. And I find that as an actor, um, I work by keying things internally. Like it's like um, I find like um, an image or a, a, a sensation or something that to me fits with the character. And so um, for me, this, there was this idea of like somebody who has been um, so deeply practiced in, in meditation, that this is, this is like this core of, of um, Buddhism, this core of detachment, this core of, of, and I'm, I think it was actually in that first episode, it talked about, she talks about, or it might be later, she's talking to book, she says, it's not that we don't feel things, it's that we've we've exercised the ability to, to not attach to the feeling. So I thought that was a beautiful, a beautiful clue or a beautiful hint about her. It's not that it's not that as a Vulcan she doesn't experience emotion. She does, but she's cultivated the ability to live on top of that. Um, so I kind of took those ideas. Uh, away and I also again to this day I don't know if I made this up or if it was in fact in that script that she was part human and so I took really? yeah and so I, I took um, that as a little bit of liberty I, I know that a lot of people talk about my performances Trina as being too emotional for them in terms of a traditional Vulcan oh. but I felt that there was a little bit that there was an emotional life or an emotional intelligence and then this very very cultivated meditative being 
um, that um, guided the entirety of the creature. If that makes sense. Unification 3 is a worthy sequel to Star Trek The Next Generation's 25th anniversary two-part episode. Now, the Discovery episode neatly ties together eras of Star Trek while effectively progressing the story, and it does honor and continue the legacy of Vulcan Romulan reunification. In this episode, a first for your character, Tarina, she was swayed by Burnham's honest argument that the Federation could be entrusted to use the SB19 data for the greater good. Now, Tarina, your character, had the data delivered to the USS Discovery and expressed to Captain Saru her receptiveness towards further communications. This is a pivotal moment I distinctly remember, as do viewers, I'm sure they do as well. Can you share with us your emotion and thoughts? I do remember very distinctly um, that the end moment that you commented on about, of, you know, Trina offering to continue the communication with Saru and, and Doug kind of going, huh, I think this might be the beginning of a romance. And I was like, really? That would be great if it was the beginning of a romance because that would mean that I'd be on this show more. And and um, I think, yeah, I think that, you know, he was such a, he was a saving grace to me on that episode because I was, you know, as, I, as I've already mentioned, very intimidated, quite nervous. And he just took me under his wing and, and he was, completely there for me um, and put my nerves at ease. Of course, an utter joy to work with him. He's such a delicious actor. And, and, uh, and I think we both, I think we both were aware of what a joy it was to work with each other. And, um, and, and up until that time, he hadn't had anything like that in his story arc. So he was really eager to kind of pursue something like that. And I think, yeah, what I was going to say, I think that he went to Michelle at that point and said, you know, do you think that this is something perhaps moving forward that could be explored? Um, and I don't, I don't think that their intention at that point was to, I think it was supposed to be a one-off. I think Trina was supposed to show up um, and disappear. And, and uh, I was very, you know, pleasantly surprised the next, the, the following year when my agent called and said, oh, they've pinned you. Like, I didn't even know going into season four, what was coming down the pike. You know, he said, they've pinned you for, 401 or 402 and I'm like great and he's like you know call a couple weeks later I said they pinned you for this episode they pinned you and it ended up being like I think she was in nine out of 12 episodes but I had no idea nobody told me <laughs> 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 so um yeah that was all very exciting that they decided to to carry that sto storyline forward and develop it in the way that they did which is so so incredibly sweet and old fashioned and respectful and lovely and all those things, yeah. Wow, this whole episode, it really felt like one giant Vulcan mind melt. I feel like I'm sharing a mind with Lily right now and Tara <laughs> for the same time. Well, that sounds like an honor if you ask me. <laughs> anyway, I hate to do this, but we must leave this episode here. And no, it is not the end of the Vulcan legacy or the legacy of a captain's log. In fact, both of those legacies shall live long and prosper. <laughs> Catch more Tara Rosling and Star Trek news next week. <laughs>